Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our eighth live meetup session in our Hack to the Future Global FinTech series. I'm your host, Madeline Loveday. I'm an environmental specialist in the ESG team at Finastro. Before we begin today's session, I wanted to share that everyone in the ESG team is uh, thinking of those who are currently affected by the events taking place in Eastern Europe. Hack to the Future is a fintech movement igniting a world of financial sustainability, inclusion and empowerment. Based on the success of our previous hackathons, we are back to redefine finance for good and build an unbiased fintech future. We're continuing to use our position in the market to inspire the fintech space to be open uh, by default for everyone. This year, we aim to drive engagement beyond our global fintech ecosystem with three key themes that are inclusive and open to all. These are environment, social governance, embedded finance and DeFi. And today we'll be talking about uh, the circular economy. I'm really excited to welcome Jay Mickey, Finastro's Global Senior Director of ESG Purpose and Impact, as well as Dr. Samad about that. Uh, COO and Deputy Dean of Ecole de Pont Business School. I'd like to first introduce Jay. Jay, can you tell us more about your role at Finastra and our ESG strategy? Sure, Maddie, and thank you for the kind introduction. So my, my name is Jay Mucky. I lead um, environmental, social and governance, as well as our purpose and impact work at Finastra. And essentially, ESG is the corporate strategy to enable the UN SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. And for those of you who tuned in, to our previous session, we did a deep dive into UN SDGs, um, their importance to solve some of the biggest planetary and social challenges that we, we face as a collective. And um, yeah, I'm really excited here to talk about circular economy with uh, Dr. Saman from Le Col de Pont. Um, uh, we've been partnering for Nastra um, with uh, Le Col de Pont for a number of years now, um, and they run fantastic programs within the, their school, their business school. Um, to highlight these these themes, these topics, um, and think about um, how you know, postgrad students and postgrad studies can be focused towards solving some of these um, these planetary and social challenges. So I think I'll I'll hand over to to Dr. Salman, who's going to just give us a brief recap of the SDGs um, and uh, and what the circular economy actually is, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who need to learn about it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, uh, Madeleine. It's a pleasure to be with you for the fourth consecutive year supporting uh, Finastra and Hack to the Future. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, so my name is Saman. Uh, we dropped the doctor. Uh, so I'm the CEO and Deputy Dean of Ecole de Pont Business School, Head of Programs and Instructional Design. Uh, Ecole de Pont Business School is the business school of Ecole Nationale de Ponts des Chaussées, also known as Ecole de Pont Paris Tech, one of the Ivy League schools in France, engineering school. So basically, Ecole de Pont Business School is uh, leading the way in terms of executive level education, degree programs, certificate programs, corporate learning programs for people who are interested in doing business for a better world. Uh, we do have a very strong uh, circular economy research center, which is uh, heavily involved with EU projects since 2017. And uh, with the success from the research center, then we started the Circular Economy Alliance which is a separate entity with a different mandate, which is basically bridging the gap between academia and practice and uh, supporting uh, grassroots uh, uh, initiatives for startups, uh, innovators to come and uh, learn about circular economy first and then innovate in that space uh, to, uh, to tackle the challenges that we, we face on the social, environmental and economic landscapes. So maybe uh, we did have a session on SDGs, right? So maybe that's yeah, correct. Want to... Very good. So briefly, just as a quick recap. So in 2015, uh, United Nations introduced the SDGs or known as also the global goals, uh, United Nations SDGs or SDGs in short, we call them. So these are 17 goals uh, that uh, they target environmental, economic and social um, advancements in terms of tackling the challenges that we have. 
so we are going to cover how circular economy and SDGs are intertwined and also the role of fintech mostly in empowering them. So in the next slide, we are going to uh, talk about the repercussions of the linear economy before we jump into the circular economy. So the linear economic model is basically uh, take, make, dispose. So we take the resources and raw materials from nature, we make products, we use them, and then we dispose them. So this is uh, unfortunately the practice that we have, uh, we have been uh, exercising for until now that we know circular economy. So the problem is that only 8.6% of the economic activity around the globe is circular today. So the circularity gap is huge. So more than 91% of what we extract and what we consume is not circulated back into the economy. So there are some statistics on the uh, on the screen that I'm not going to read uh, through all of them, but basically the uh, the linear economic model uh, is uh, aggra aggra uh, aggravating the, uh, the situation with natural resources, uh, depletion, biodiversity loss and climate change. So in the next slide, uh, we are going to see uh, the problem that we are facing. So this, this is an old uh, image that you might have all seen during COVID. So it shows, uh, you know, although COVID was really very hard for all of us and still is challenging and uh, it was not easy to deal with, still not easy to deal with, but then we see that there are economic recessions that follow and then the climate change. And the biggest one is the biodiversity collapse. So basically, as a continuation of this linear economic model, uh, we have 15% increase in global per capita consumption since 1980s. Uh, we will lose 23% of natural habitats by uh, 2100, and that is very generous already. Uh, unfortunately, it's even worse than that. We have already lost 15% uh, of the uh, live coral cover uh, since the 70s. And uh, within the past 40 years, we have lost 68% of biodiversity. So this is, uh, this is the worst uh, that can happen, obviously, for the environment. And unfortunately, uh, within the 2020s, the anthropogenic mass, which means that uh, the mass of the uh, products that we humans are creating, is surpassing the global living natural biomass. Uh, on Earth. So this means that basically how we are changing the environment on Earth by the things that we create, the buildings, all the devices and everything else is going to be more than all the living uh, natural biomass on Earth. So in the next slide, uh, we are going to briefly talk about the circular economy as an alternative economic model. So this is the butterfly diagram, which is uh, uh, by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So this is something that uh, you might have seen. So basically, this shows the circular economy alternative as uh, from a high level. So we have the, uh, uh, the biosphere and the technosphere. So biosphere on the left, technosphere on the right. So it shows creating circles in order to keep the products on the right side in use as much as possible. And on the left side, it shows us how to improve um, how we use the natural resources um, uh, in our economy. So in the next slide, we are going to see quickly how uh, the level of biodiversity is declining drastically uh, on the black line, on the uh, on the dark line, you see that if we continue doing the business as usual, we are going to uh, lose more and more the biodiversity. And as we all know, biodiversity loss is will threaten life on the planet for everyone. So then, in between, we have increased. Uh, well, if we do a bit better uh, of converse, uh, con uh, of uh, conservation and restoration effort, so we can sort of. Uh, help the situation a bit, but the best is that if we transform our businesses and our practices into a more circular approach uh, to use materials more intelligently. So hopefully that will uh, help our, our biodiversity, but it's more than that. It's beyond biodiversity, obviously, circular economy. So in the next slide, uh, we are going to see the um, on a high level, the difference between the linear economy and the circular economy. So in between, we have this 
the recycling economy. So on the left, we have the linear economy, which is take, make, dispose, obviously leading into waste, uh, pollution, biodiversity loss, and depletion of natural resources and everything else. In between, we had the recycling economy. To some extent, we learned how to better use uh, our products, our resources by doing recycling. But with circular economy, in fact, we have 10 steps so these 10 steps help us uh, better engage uh, with a more sustainable uh, practice for the environment and uh, it has a more comprehensive approach uh, than the recycling economy in fact if you look recycling is only one to the last uh, so it's not that great actually in terms of practice but that was the first thing that we could come up with obviously and we were very happy about it but now we know that recycling is not enough at all so we have much more to do, which we are going to talk about uh, in the next slides uh, very briefly. So this is an example that shows um, the, the destruction of value in the linear economy on the left pyramid and how we can retain and regenerate value on the right pyramid. So on, as you can see, well, we have the extraction, manufacturing, assembly, retail, and then the end user receives the product. So the, the value is accumulated up to uh, you know, the, the final product. The user receives the product, the product is used, disposed, the value is destroyed afterwards. However, on the right pyramid, we can see that there are, uh, we have created cycles. We have created cycles in order to have uh, recycling, remanufacturing, refurbishing, and many of the 10 R's that we saw in the previous slide in order to retain value of the products and materials after use. So in the next slide, we are going to basically talk about the three principles of the circular economy. So in circular economy, basically, we narrow down the loops, we slow down the loops, and we close the loops. So narrow down means using fewer resources, so minimizing extraction and consumption of raw materials. Slowing down means extending the life cycle of products, which is more efficient use of resources. And the third one is closing the loops by maximizing materials use cycles, which is designing out waste. So there are many different ways that, uh, that we can design out waste, obviously from simple practices within the 10 Rs up to more advanced forms of industrial symbiosis that unfortunately we don't have time to cover those. But basically these three principles of circular economy is what we focus on, narrow down, slow down and close. So in the next slide, I guess, uh, Jay, do you want to jump in? Yes. So thank you so much, Saman. I think, um, you know, the circular economy seem, might seem complex at first, but really it can be a lot more simple and it's it's a lot, it's, it's such a, a, a better model for our economy and both our society. Um, Jay, at Finastra, a part of our ESG strategy, how do we incorporate the circular economy and what is the role in fintechs within circular economy? Actually, Maddie, can we get, can we just get rid of the slides for a moment so uh, our viewers can see us um, as I talk through this? So, you know, firstly, a massive thank you to, to Saman. Um, what a treat for all of us. Um, you can see why Le Col de Pond is one of the leading business schools in the world. And I just got a taste and so did all of you of um, the quality of teaching uh, and the innovative thought uh, that uh, goes into the approaches to curriculum within uh, Nicole Dupont's programs. Um, but um, hopefully you understand the circular economy a little bit better now. Someone spoke about you know, the SDGs and the economic, environmental and social aspects of them. And normally when you have an environmental benefit, there's numerous social benefits. Right. But one of the things that we really need to be cognizant of is if we achieve the economic goals of the SDGs, right, that actually will. So as cities grow, as we you know, increase GDP, we create more products that typically leads to a loss of wildlands as and, and biodiversity, unfortunately. Right. So as as we achieve economic growth, we have to be considerate to um, loss of environmental um, aspects like biodiversity and, and, and wildlands. And, um, you know, that's one major consideration. I think that's one one of the very few examples where, you know, by achieving one of the SDGs actually has a negative impact on, on the other. Um, but 
you know, with that in mind, the circular economy and, and the principles of circularity is is a really fantastic uh, solution. And, you, and we saw all the benefits from uh, from the slides that um, that uh, someone spoke about. So um, I'm going to give uh, just three examples of um, companies that are are doing things in innovative ways, sustainable ways, um, and where fintech and Finastra has been trying to um, assist the development. I and mean, Maddie, we spoke in the last section about being at COP, and circular economy was actually one of the major themes at COP26. Um, we heard from uh, lots of different, uh, very viable businesses that spoke about how we support the demand for for the products and services we need in the future without compromising um, you know, environmental uh, loss damage, et cetera. Um, so I think the, the first one I want to talk about is alternative energies in Kenya. All right, now, this is a, um, a, a company that has developed a technology to collect plastic waste, and plastic gets a really bad rep. I mean, anyone who's seen Seaspiracy is very cognizant of the danger uh, of plastic to the ocean, in particular, someone spoke about the loss of, um, of coral reefs as a result of things like this. Right? But if we can think about a way that we can reuse plastic to create something that we need to support you know, the other SDGs uh, and economic growth in particular, um, then you know, we're, we're starting to solve these problems. Right? And so Alternative Energy Kenya um, have developed some technology and a process to collect plastic waste, put it into, uh, in through this process in a factory um, to create two outputs. The two outputs are biofuel, which is really good for powering generators and an alternative to diesel, which is obviously very harmful to the environment. And it creates carbon black. So this uh, essentially this powder and this carbon black can have a variety of uses. The way alternative energy are thinking about it is to create bricks. So bricks to that can create, build new homes that can build new, uh, new commercial spaces. Um, so, you know, just taking something that would normally be sitting in landfill using it to create something that we actually need. This is um, uh, a great example of, uh, of circular economy. But what do alternative energy need, right? So they need finance, essentially, to make their product viable in, in, in the economy. They need access to affordable capital to invest in their business and make that whole process really efficient in terms of cost and obviously production distribution, right? And this is where FinTech can help. And this is where Finastra is trying to um, assist uh, companies like Alternative Energy to connect them to banks who can provide them access to green finance to invest in those production cycles to uh, to reduce uh, their cost and also be part of the supply chain of companies like Celsa Group Steel, who we heard from at COP uh, in, in in Glasgow. And so that's, you know, so they use um, uh, uh, same circular economy principles. They collect scrap metals instead of might to, they create steel, essentially green steel. And, and instead of mining the earth for, for iron ore to create steel, they use scrap metal, again, which is sitting somewhere in landfill causing pollution. So they collect that. Um, they put it through a process that uses an electric furnace, which is nine times more carbon efficient than a traditional blast furnace that you, uh, that, uh, um, in a traditional steel manufacturer would use, um, that leverages coal, which as we know is one of the most polluting fossil fuels. Um, and it creates this product, which is almost like for like uh, uh, with regards to you know the integrity of, of traditional steel, um, but it's so much better for the environment, and we know that we're going to need steel in the future to support the the economic growth and the and the developing world in particular, as we build homes, bridges, uh, other types of infrastructure. Right, so we know we need it, um, and we know it's causing uh, a lot of carbon emissions the way we're doing it today in the linear way, right? But if we can leverage this, you know, collecting scrap metal, so solving one problem there, using a, a process which is much more carbon efficient, um, then, um, then you know, we can solve some of these problems. And again, you know, um, there's something called the green premium, uh, which is the cost, the additional cost to do things in a sustainable way. And good companies are essentially being punished for being environmentally friendly because their products are more expensive typically than um, than companies that are using you know cheap cheap uh, cheap inputs like coal uh, to produce their products and there's no carbon tax right we spoke about this in the last session there's no um, market regulation for, by government to penalize companies that uh, produce a lot of emissions 
um, and incentivize or reward uh, companies that do things sustainably through subsidies and grants and things like that, right? So this is where finance, and we spoke about this again in the last session, um, this is where finance can really play a crucial role because through the provision of green finance, sustainable finance, ESG investing, all these types of uh, um, trends that are starting to emerge in, within financial services, we can actually provide lower financing costs to these firms and their customers who choose um, who choose these products to offset that green premium. Right? Uh, and this is really how we fund the circular economy. Right? No one needs to actually um, be worse off financially for incorporating these principles. So um, that's what I'm really excited about. That's what Finastra is working on. You know, how do we enable our lending solutions like Loan IQ, all our retail solutions you know, for, to, to influence uh, in individual choices, but you know, particularly at that top end of lending, syndicated lending. You know, so how would we get an, an oil refinery company to when they build a new rig on the Gulf of Mexico? Because we're going to need energy, right? Let's be honest. We can't do everything through new, renewable sources. How do we get that company to buy green steel instead of traditional steel to build that rig, right? Um, it might not solve the problem of extracting oil from the, from the ocean, right? Um, but um, it will make sure that that rig is, is built in a more sustainable way that doesn't cause downstream emissions, right? Uh, and, um, and, and this is uh, where Finastra feels uh, through its technology and its ecosystem and, and our customers, obviously, financial institutions, we can really make a difference. And this is why I'm so excited about the Circular Economy Alliance from the Cold Upon Business School. Um, they are identifying companies like Salsa, like Alternative Energies, um, that Finastra has proposed for membership, financial institutions as well, who are thinking progressively as it pertains to ESG, and, and building this group of uh, companies and that are committed to the circular economy and the principles of circularity and sustainability. Um, and then the research center, uh, like someone spoke about, is doing all the due diligence, right? So finance institutions uh, don't have to procure uh, consultants, specialists to to pr provide uh, uh, expertise regarding, you know, those green green loans and uh, and sustainably linked loans. Um, so if we can scale that knowledge uh, that uh, they're called upon and working on and make it available for all financial services participants. Um, that's um, incredibly exciting and something that I think there's a really good fintech opportunity around, right? And everyone thinking about what kind of innovation they can build in this hackathon. You know, I would highly encourage you to think about how you can support the circular economy principles uh, as you think about uh, as you think about your solutions, because this is, you know, not just going to be, um, you know, profitable and on trend. It's going to help save the planet, which is. Um, you know, the number one priority that we face as a collective, uh, I think, in, in this world. But I think we're actually going to watch a video from uh, Le Col de Pont Business School student uh, who put forward a, a fantastic hackathon entry, which ended up winning the environmental category in 2020, um, just so that everyone tuning in can get an understanding of how, where the intersection of finance, fintech, and uh, SDGs and circular economy um, sits. Uh, and just hopefully we'll provide a little bit of inspiration to all the hackers out there. What other businesses in their area might want to partner up? Our solution includes regulation compliance and water quality control check. The platform will also help generate awareness and facilitate communication amongst interested parties. And it will go as far as developing the optimal technical solution, providing help identifying costs, and even contacting potential partners to build a water recycle plan, making it easy for even small businesses to find the right resources and support to make water reuse affordable for them. Once the project is completed and checked for regulatory compliance, the Water Reuse Booster acts as a crowdfunding platform for those projects that have been approved. The Water Reuse Booster Marketplace Smart Contract has been designed to run on the public Ethereum blockchain. This allows investors who are interested in a specific project to easily specify the amount they wish to invest by their MetaMask wallets. 
the smart contract secures these investments by holding the funds until the goal is achieved or releasing them back to investors should the project fail to gain enough support. Utilizing this innovative blockchain solution, the water reuse Exposed to marketplace brings decentralized funding to decentralized water. Thanks, Jay. Um, so that video shows our hackathon's uh, winner from uh, the hackathon in 2020, and that was actually a student from the Circular Economy um, Ecole de Pont School. Um, and we will share the video with you again. Uh, just in case there were any technical issues there. Um, so without further ado, Saman, did you want to just um, tell us anything more about the, the concept um, that won the hackathon? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Sure, yes. Uh, so basically, we were on uh, the role of fintech in circular economy and SDGs. Uh, so basically, what can uh, fintech uh, do to support circular economy SDGs. So in the next slide, we can see one of the uh, uh, one of the applications uh, that AI and chatbots they have in fintech for customer support. I mean, this is like one of the basic examples how fintech is empowering the uh, the classic uh, financial institutions uh, as we have uh, worked with them these days. So this is just one simple example. The next one talks about the importance of having deep learning in fintech for fraud detection. So applying AI algorithms these days, fintech solutions can help uh, classic financial institutions uh, to prevent, to find and prevent uh, fraud. So which is, uh, which is very important when we talk about SDGs as well as circular economy, obviously. The next slide, then basically we talk about the role of fintech for empowering omni-channel and customer-centric banking. So these days, fintech, as you know, they integrate into most of the platform, social media, uh, all types of uh, basically channels that we use to communicate, to interact with, in order to facilitate uh, the banking services that we need to use. Uh, the next one then basically talks about the biometrics in fintech, obviously, uh, that these days with smart uh, phones and uh, with our uh, devices, we can use higher security using biometrics. But then it's more about, uh, there's much more about uh, the role of fintech in uh, empowering circular economy and SDGs. So the next slide, uh, we can see quickly how fintech can support uh, for a better, uh, building a better foundation. So basically, we know that there is a big gap when it comes to uh, SDGs and uh, well, circular economy is uh, obvious, but for SDGs already to achieve SDGs, already there's a big financial gap. So fintech solutions can help us secure those funds uh, using different uh, methods and channels. Uh, then we have also, uh, you know, fintech solutions uh, bring financial inclusion, which also drives social inclusion. They empower microeconomies, basically. So when we're talking about crowdfunding solutions and applications using fintech, we can quickly think about how they can uh, empower uh, different uh, classes of society which are uh, less fortunate or they have uh, limited access to funds or they are not a part of the real economy. So these type of solutions fintech can really support empowering SDGs and also for circular economy uh, in the sense that circular economy is a multi-stakeholder uh, economic model. Basically, we need everyone to be involved. If you remember the, uh, the example from the pyramid, if the end user is not engaged with the circular economy, it is, we can say it's impossible for companies to take control on the circulation of the material and resources. So we definitely need to have all the uh, value chain engaged, all the stakeholders, the end users specifically, engaged within uh, the circular economy. Simple ways that we can think about the role of fintech is basically to incentivize people and end users to support circular economy, to help companies retrieve the materials after use, to empower people and so to incentivize people to uh, create uh, novel business models, 
and economic models, you know, supporting sharing economy. We have many examples of fintechs, uh, specifically in the UK. We have a couple which are leading the way. Uh, creating uh, applications and ecosystems for people to share, sell, resell, and buy uh, used products, basically, instead of, uh, you know, disposing uh, maybe a pair of jeans that you don't use anymore, you can uh, resell it or share it. So these are very simple practices that can help uh, with a more secure economy. So in the next slide, uh, here we can see, again, the 10 R's uh, in between. So the Fusion Fabric Cloud by Finastra is actually one of these uh, best, one of the best examples that I know personally that uh, is uh, engaging the ecosystem and this multi-stakeholder uh, economy that we need, uh, bringing universities, banks, uh, consultants, system integrators, uh, you know, the fintech developers, the whole community together uh, in order to innovate and uh, to come up with uh, novel solutions and business models. So in the next slide, we can see another uh, sort of uh, a view of how Fusion Fabric Cloud can help with the 10 R's. So these 10 R's are basically the 10 R's of circular economy. The lower we go, uh, the less circular it is, the higher, the more. So as we can see, the last one is recovering, which is basically uh, recovering materials, incineration, uh, then we have recycling and then we have repurposing, but the best ones obviously on the top is refuse, rethink, reduce. Uh, so Fusion Fabric Cloud is an enabler that brings developers, uh, business model innovators, and uh, all the ecosystem together around finding these type of solutions. So these are like great examples of applications of fintech uh, to support secure economy and SDGs. So in the next slide also, we can see quickly the uh, sort of the ecosystem that the Fusion Fabric Cloud uh, provides uh, for innovators and entrepreneurs. So basically, uh, unfortunately, we have more consumption and that's that's a fact that we need to obviously think about uh, degrowth and consuming less and everything else. But this is the fact that we are having more consumers, we are having more producers, we need more intelligent apps and we need decision uh, automation in order to augment the experiences that we have and also to infuse insight into the decisions that we make, obviously based on data. So Fusion Fab Fabric Cloud is basically at the heart of this uh, ecosystem modeling in order to bring all these stakeholders around the table. Uh, so with that, I guess uh, we can open for questions. If, uh, I mean, on my side, I'm done, Jay. I don't know if... Uh, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, you know, I just want to pick up on one of the themes you touched there, which is financial inclusion. And one of, you know, that's a major theme within Hack to the Future this year, as it has been in previous years, about inclusive finance. Um, and really thinking about the principles of circularity as they pertain to monetary systems, uh, financial services, um, and, uh, and financial systems. So I'm, um, uh, you know, way back when, when I was at university, I studied economics and um, we we learned about the multiplier effect and you know the opportunity with financial inclusion and and the principles of circularity not particularly the circular economy because that's really about products and homemade products that last and reuse and repair like you say but if we think about you know the money in the economy if you've got cash um you know a, a financially excluded person is holding cash that cash is not working in the economy right it's sitting in someone's drawer it's sitting uh, under a mattress, right? Um, and it can't be working in the economy. Um, and what the multiplier effect teaches us is that if we can actually get that money into the economy, into the banking system, that could be used as collateral to enable loans, right? And those loans could be used to uh, help someone start a new business or help someone buy their home or, um, you know, get a get a loan for solar panels, uh, which is something that Finash is working on, right? Um, so, you know, if we can get uh, I think around about 80% of the of the emerging markets, um, uh, small businesses are operating outside of the formal economy. And so if we can get, if we can think about how we financially include those those businesses, how we get them paying corporate taxes, which can then be invested into government investments, into you know, education, infrastructure, uh, healthcare, you know, these are, these are going to achieve a lot of the SDGs. Um, and also, 
um, give access to those financially excluded to capital, right? And capital is, you know, what's going to finance this whole transition. So I think that's a, that's a first uh, thing I just wanted to pick up on, like the importance of financial inclusion, getting everyone participating in financial services and benefiting from them and getting the money out of physical cash into digital cash and working for the economy. I think, um, you know, it's, it leverages this, this, these principles of circularity. The second thing, right? Um, so, you know, we've made fantastic innovations um, in terms of environmental sustainability. You know, so I mentioned solar panels, right? Solar panels have a, a 25, um, maybe at best 30 year life expectancy, right? But what happens to these panels once they reach end of life, right? How are we going to leverage the principles of circular economy to ensure that those resources that have been deployed and achieved those, those benefits in terms of um, avoiding emissions through, uh, through renewable energy? What, what is the future for those panels, right? And this is where, you know, we really need to think about the full circle uh, in, in, in these types of things, right? Another one is electric vehicles. Uh, so electric uh, vehicles like Tesla and, and Porsche and BMW, they've all been investing into this. But there's a, a lot of stigma around the mining of nickel to, to create the batteries. Um, and what happens to those batteries when they reach end of life, right? So, you know, um, uh, you know, I think one of the other thing I wanted to talk about was marketplaces. Uh, and as Simon was talking, I was thinking about eBay. eBay is essentially a fintech, right? It's a fintech marketplace. It's a place where you can buy secondhand goods that are no longer needed by the by the owner, and they can be sold to the uh, to somebody else who really wants that, right? But what is that? So that's an individual level, like a pair of jeans or a trumpet or whatever it is, right? But um, you know, what? It, where is the marketplaces for the solar panels, for the nickel? And wouldn't it be fantastic if we had a, a hackathon entry this year that um, that figured out how we create marketplaces for those products that are going to reach end of life um, and how do we reuse them or how do we repair them or regenerate them, um, leveraging these, um, these circular economy principles to ensure that they continue to have a value and they don't just end up in landfill because that is what's going to um, help us, like I say, in our, in our journey towards net zero uh, by 2050 and even sooner than that hopefully the achievement of the sdgs by 2030 um so um again i think it's a, a real treat uh for everyone tuning in that we got to hear um from from saman uh, and the thinking at the cold upon business school normally people pay a lot of money for this Saman, right uh, to get this kind of uh, insight uh, and everyone today has got it for uh for free and this is this is knowledge and information that is that should be available to everyone, I, I believe. Um, but I'll always say this, yeah, knowledge without experience and application is just philosophy, right? So we need to think about how we apply these principles to real life scenarios to, uh, to achieve the goals of the SDGs and, and, uh, and, uh, and net zero by, by 2050. Thanks, Jay. You might just have a winning hackathon idea there, it sounds like. Um, I wanted to think about, you gave some really good examples there of the circular economy um, in practice. And one of the things that, that the three of us were discussing before this session was the shared or the gig economy. Um, so kind of like eBay, um, companies like Airbnb or Zipcar are great examples of how we can share resources um, internally be between you know, consumers. Um, so uh, thinking of, of a world where we don't all individually own holiday homes or cars and we share those resources between us. That's another great example of the circular economy in practice. And we are starting to see more and more um, people moving towards these kind of um, consumption of shared goods um, and shared economy. Um, Saman, I don't know if you have any kind of other examples of shared economy or that you're looking at that um, at the at CERC? So basically uh, what we are looking at now, uh, there are several very interesting projects that are coming up in, in terms of uh, waste management as well uh, that are basically on the same principle. Uh, but if I want to take like a, one step back and give uh, like a bigger picture uh, as an example, which we, we don't have time to dive deep into, but uh, it's just a good uh, 
overview if you like. So we talked about industrial symbiosis. Uh, so industrial symbiosis is basically a group of uh, uh, production facilities, companies, uh, organizations coming together around the geographic, uh, ge around the same geography, in order to share byproducts and waste, uh, and to use waste as resources for the other, uh, as as input sources for another manufacturing process, for example. So there are many interesting. Uh, things happening there, uh, nothing concrete is out yet. I mean, there are obviously uh, pilot programs in the Netherlands for this one, uh, for, for, a, for more a more C2C sort of uh, symbiosis. Uh, but in terms of industrial symbiosis and, uh, uh, and eco-industrial parks, we actually are working uh, with one of our students of the Leap Tech MBA uh, this year. Uh, he's working on a blockchain solution in order to incentivize uh, more people uh, and more companies to take part into this type of initiative. There are examples also uh, such as platforms that try to connect these type of uh, manufacturing facilities together in order to take the waste from one, use the waste as resources and input for the other. So this is closing the loop. This is designing out waste at the same time, uh, narrowing down the loops because instead of extracting more resources from nature uh, we are basically uh, reusing what is already out there and process and waste so uh, and in the long term it obviously slows down the loop because uh, the products and material are going to stay in use for much longer so there are uh, great initiatives in this sense but i really look forward to seeing more coming up uh, from the hackathon this year, because also Hack to the Future, this is the first time that we are having circular economy here. Uh, so I really look forward to see how uh, the entrepreneurs and innovators that we have in the hackathon this year can leverage uh, the Fusion Fabric Cloud and all the resources that Finastra is providing in order to come up with uh, with solutions. So I see one question uh, from the audience that uh, is asking about uh, more resources about circular economy. Uh, so for that, if you check the, uh, the hackathon's resources page, uh, we do have a specific uh, scholarship for the circular economy certificate programs uh, that uh, we are offering to all participants of, uh, of this hackathon. And in addition to that, obviously we have, uh, for winners, we have uh, more interesting uh, prizes as well from the business school. We have scholarships on executive MBA and executive doctorate in business administration. But in terms of resources, I invite you also to take a look into Ellen MacArthur Foundation and European Union's commission, uh, which uh, they, they provide fantastic resources, uh, research and uh, application use cases for circular economy. I hope that helps. That's really helpful. Thank you so much, Samuel. And you're right, we do have quite a few questions coming in from uh, the chat. So please do continue to ask your questions for our, um, our two speakers whilst we have them on the line. Um, so Shireen has asked, and this came into the example of the video that we, that we watched before, um, but any other examples of how decentralized finance can help with the sustainable development goals and sustainability challenges, particularly, of course, in the circular economy? Uh, may I? Can you take one, Simon? Yeah, sure. So basically, decentralized finance is, uh, let's say, I mean, there are different, uh, different schools of thought about uh, DeFi blockchain versus fintech or as an upgrade to fintech or just a natural sort of evolution of the fintech uh, leveraging blockchain technology so everything that fintech can do DeFi can do and also DeFi can maybe do a bit more in empowering fintech by de decentralizing finance and providing access even to more people the unbanked people um, basically to have more financial inclusion and social inclusion. So for now, the unfortunately, the most uh, heard uh, use cases on DeFi are on uh, sp speculations and creation of uh, crypto assets for trading. I'm not going to judge the value of those, but uh, 
when it comes to circular economy and uh, SDGs, what we are really interested in seeing is really how these type of solutions can empower uh, microeconomies and the financially excluded population and uh, communities that we have. So that would be my two cents about DeFi because DeFi itself, we, we do have a session separately on DeFi. And also it's, it's very wide and it's a rabbit hole. So uh, if we enter, uh, I guess we need to stay for much longer on the session. Yeah, we could really go down a rabbit hole on, on DeFi and it does tend to come up in these sessions very often. Uh, Jay, did you have anything to add on that on that topic? No, just I think um, decentralized finance is, uh, like, like someone said, is a way to financially include people, not restrict um, payments or, or um, fintech associated benefits to a particular currency or country. Um, it just opens up a whole realm of possibilities. We saw in the in the um, pitch from uh, from 2020, the winning hack entry. You know they used Ethereum there to um, to facilitate payments between the marketplace participants, um, and I think that's something that's very interesting. But obviously, we need to be cognizant, like uh, like uh, someone said, of the of the environmental downstream effects of uh, decentralized finance. Um, I you know personally, I'd love to see. A, coin, a crypto coin that is not as um, you know mathematically uh, uh, intensive, uh, you know, in terms of the the the, 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 the way it's mined, etc., uh, to be more environmentally efficient. But certainly, the principles um, you know create so many opportunities for people all over the world who who may be unbanked or may be you know um, excluded from the global economy. Um, so that um, that is where I see the opportunity. But it's all about how do we create these ecosystems, right, uh, of all the participants who can um, essentially create these circular economy models um, and how does money move around um, to, to support the, the running of it, right? Um, and this is, a, this is where I see the big opportunity. But I also wanted just to pick up on your point, Maddie, right, uh, about, you know, things like Airbnb and, um, and, and others where, you know, where you to making, utilizing resources that are that are you know um not being leveraged in the economy and creating value out of it right um i think there's a certainly a mind sh set shift amongst younger generations so you know millennials gen z's and the previous generation before me wanted to own everything own their house own their cars um and i see a shift in the way uh, of thinking i don't know if it's conscious or subconscious but um, young, younger people, younger generations are certainly more willing to rent, more willing to lease, more willing to, um, you know, uh, use secondhand products, um, make things last a little bit longer. Um, and so, you know, I said, like I said, uh, uh, I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious, but um, certainly Greta Thunberg and people like her are doing great work to, to raise the awareness in younger generations uh, who are going to hopefully solve a lot of these problems and, um, you know, uh, limit the need for more creating more and maximizing what we already have uh to to not create the environmental destruction that um, economic growth unfortunately causes yeah certainly i think there's almost like a renaissance of that mend and make do mentality which just makes so much more sense to to really utilize the things that we buy and that we we consume and we use um, I did also want to mention that there was a session specifically around DeFi and uh, cryptocurrency, which uh, explored some of the different innovations into um, how uh, cryptos can become more sustainable and environmentally friendly. So definitely go and check that out on our LinkedIn page if you haven't already watched it. So we have a question come through from our YouTube and this uh, question, Simon, I think specifically relates to one of the examples that you gave of fintech and SDGs um, around um, fraud and AI. So um, the, the question says, how would the AI solution be able to detect the fraud? I don't know if that's something that you want to go into, um, but maybe we could just touch on that. Yeah, quickly, because it, it becomes very technical. So yeah. AI in detection of uh, fraud basically uses machine learning algorithm and deep learning for most of the time in order to to find suspicious patterns uh, 
which would lead to discovering uh, fraud. So basically, as we know, the power of AI, machine learning and deep learning is in uh, very quick analysis of a wide spectrum of uh, data that it's almost impossible for a human to do. Uh, so that is how leveraging AI, machine learning and deep learning uh, into fintech has considerably helped us uh, fighting fraud. Uh, so basically, it stays on that high level, if you like. If not, it becomes, I mean, we need to talk about the neural networks and all the technicalities of AI if we want to just, uh, you know, uh, go deeper into this conversation. But on a high level, basically, uh, it's a sort of an analysis, uh, a sort of a predictive analysis based on the data that uh, the machine, the AI, uh, has gathered so far or has been uh, trained to work on and then finding the patterns that could potentially lead into fraud. So in many instances, we do need human intervention to sort of judge, if you like, uh, to see whether it's a fraud or not. But uh, in many instances, AIs are becoming more and more in independent in terms of decision making when it comes to fraud detection, just at least to uh, raise the red flag and then a human intervention to uh, to either uh, check it for okay or to reject it and do the necessary behind for the regulatory process. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And, you know, I remember 10 years ago, um, I, had a, I had an account with, um, with actually a customer for Nastro. Uh, I'm sure I can say it's Barclays. And I, um, I got an alert about a, a cash withdrawal in Jamaica. Um, right after I had used my debit card in the UK. And that obviously, you know, was a flag transaction that Barclays made me aware of and, and said, look, we suspect this is fraud. Um, and they called me up to, to see if I was in Jamaica um, and made that transaction. Right? And that was 10 years ago. Now, with the technologies like AI, you know, like someone said, they can, you can see the patterns and say, okay, well, this is, you know, Jay's typical spending habits. This one sits outside of that. Um, is this a suspicious activity? But instead of the bank needing to call me up, so it's not just on the detection, it's also on the customer service element, right? Because now it can just automatically generate um, a, a text message to my phone to say, um, you know, we've this transaction has gone through in your account. Was this you? Y for yes, N for no. I answer that, and then you know, there's no need for anybody to do anything physical. It's all managed by um by the algorithms looking at my 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 account data right um and this is you know so th this is already being used today in the retail banking space i'm sure in the corporate banking space um but um you know what is the next evolution of that how do we um understand you know fraud um corruption uh, all these types of things and how can we use the technologies that are emerging um uh, in, in financial services like ai ml deep learning, et cetera, to, to identify it and then mitigate it, right, in, in a way which is sustainable, which doesn't require um, the expense of human capital. Um, so these are the types of things that I would, I'm really hopeful to see in this hackathon this year. Every year, the, the, the entries just get better and better. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, um, to reviewing what comes through uh, and being inspired by the outside and thinking uh, that we, we benefit from at Finastra through this hackathon. Thank you so much, Jay. And and of course, Saman too, you will also be playing a role in the hackathon, um, looking at submissions. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, excuse me, I just lost you for one second, two seconds. Oh, can you tell us more about the role that you're going to play in, in Hack to the Future? Yes, sure, with pleasure. So basically, we are going to deliver a couple of uh, sessions and discussions. We actually have one coming up in uh, digital design thinking for secure economy. Uh, and then I'll be on the jury as well, and then supporting the team wherever that is required. So we do have, uh, I think I mentioned this, but we do have some support from the business school and from the Secure Economy Alliance in terms of programs that participants can uh, take a look into. We have uh, specific prizes for the winners, but also we have very good support for all the participants, uh, which I believe they are all uh, listed on the resources tab of the DevPost page of the Hack to the Future of this year. Uh, 
And of course, I, I remain at, uh, at people's disposal on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to support you. Thank you so much, Saman. Um, and I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I feel like we could spend so much time on this topic. But as Saman said, we do have some more top. We do have some more sessions coming up, the first of which on the 30th of March, the design thinking session on circular economy with Saman, Jay, myself, and also our guest from BMP Paribas. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jay and Saman for your insights. I think it's been a really great session. Thank you for the audience for your questions. Um, and just remember to check all the hackathon info and events at finastro.com forward slash hack to the future. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we'll end it there. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much.